Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Baird. I'm an attorney in Burlington and have been an attorney uh, since 1977, which is really like medieval times, I guess. I became an attorney through clerking for the bar for four years rather than going to law school. At that time, I worked at Vermont Legal Aid and I was the paralegal who was in charge of all the family law problems and there were many. Um, and so tonight we're going to present uh, uh, a talk on the family law court and all of its relevance to all of our lives. And with me tonight is Susan Fowler, the uh, ex, I guess, probate judge of Chittenden County. So she will be talking about the probate court and its relevance to family issues. And I will be talking about the family court uh, of Chittenden County and it's also its relevance to our all of our families. And Susan was the uh, probate judge in Chittenden. She's a graduate, I believe, of Vermont Law School. She was a prosecutor in Chittenden County, as I was. But she was uh, after me. And she was also, I believe, Susan, were you the juvenile prosecutor? She's not there right now. But anyway. Uh, she'll be, she'll be on yeah, in the she'll be there. Uh, I was also the juvenile prosecutor. And the juvenile court is also part of the family court. So we will be talking a little bit about that today. Okay, so with that, I guess, um, I'll check. I guess Susan is setting up in a different room where I think she will have better access to this meeting. Uh, so I will give a little wrap about the family court, the history of the family court, and it does have a history, and then talk a little bit about why I think it is essential for everybody to uh, understand what the family court is and what it is not, because most of us, if unfortunately we find ourselves in any court, it will most likely be family court because family court deals, as I said in the intro, with the most private parts of our lives, the most intimate part of our lives, our families, our sex lives in a lot of ways, our um, property divisions, our lives as a whole, and of course our death. And Susan will, I think, talk more about the latter part about what happens after you die, but also she and the probate court has a, has a lot to do with children as well. That's where guardianship and adoption happen, right, Susan? Right. So Susan, I'm gonna start with a little wrap about uh, family court, okay? Sure. And then I will, and, and by the way, this is not going to be as the other people's law schools presentations, we do not have a PowerPoint. So we really encourage discussion and questions. I don't know how many people are out there, but since family law concerns us all, I thought that would be um, a kind of, at least a little bit interesting way to go. Okay, so what is the family court? The family court, uh, as I mentioned, deals with the really the private parts of our lives, the most intimate parts of our lives. The family court deals with breaking up relationships, raising up children, with our sex lives, um, and what is private about our lives. And unfortunately, family court becomes a part of our lives when all of those relationships break down in some way. Other than that, uh, the law says that our family lives is private and should not be in the jurisdiction of the state unless something goes seriously wrong. And that happens far too often, I believe, in our family lives. I don't know what you think, Susan, what do you think? Judge, I'm sorry, Judge Fowler. <laughs> no, no, you don't think I'm a judge Fowler. I'm not a judge anymore. No, uh, no, I mean, things go wrong all the time and we never think they will, but they, but they do with regularity. And then you find up, find out that you have to learn all about the court system that you didn't really ever want to know about. And you still don't want to know once you find you yourself. You still don't want to know about it. No, it's pretty. And I would say that most of the judges and I and Susan and everyone would say, stay out of court, period, if you can do that. Huh. Really, wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with that? No, no. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit though about marriage itself and why that is a subject for the family court. Because we think about marriage sometimes as a voluntary association between two adults. However, it's not really. Um, it is voluntary in general, but it is based on a contract. Marriage is still a contract between two um, adults. 
now those adults can be not just a man and a woman, but also same-sex marriage. And let's talk a little bit about the history of marriage, which was rooted, of course, in male-female uh, marriage. And then we will talk a little bit also about same-sex marriage. Okay, so what is it a contract about? I bet all of us have been married, maybe not, but I guess most people get married at one point or another in their lives. And when you enter a marriage, you are entering a contract. What is the nature of that contract? The nature of the contract is that you will spend the rest of your life with one person, that you will be faithful to that person, that you will be monogamous, and that you promise all of that till death do you part. And you honor, and I guess they took the word. Did they take make it word? sound so good, Sandy. Make it sound so, so good. <laughs> Oh, well, but Susan, doesn't it have a, okay, so I want to ask you a question. Have you, have you officiated it at marriages lately? Oh, uh, no, not since I be, lost my judge powers, but I did a lot of them when I was a judge. Okay, so is the word in the marriage vows still obey? No, well, only if you put it in. Okay. Only put it in. Most people don't put that in. Some do, but most don't. Okay, so the original contract, though, is that you were going to honor and obey whomever you were marrying till death do you part, and that you were going to be sexually faithful um, as a promise back. Is that right? What do you think, Judge? Yeah. Wasn't that the nature of it? Sure. Okay, so that was a contract between two people, and, the, and it gave... Uh, certain rights to people, certain obligations, that contract. In terms of what it uh, did for fathers and men, in particular, was it gave uh, the father the presumption that any child born during the marriage was his child. Okay, without marriage, there's no such presumption. Isn't that true also, Judge? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so then the father historically would know who his kids were, at least presumptively, and that those were the children that would inherit his property when he died. It gave him then a certainty that those were his kids because in a marriage, there's a presumption that the husband is the father, no matter where that husband is. He could be off in the service for six years or in prison for six years, which some are, and still, if the, his wife has a child, it is his child. Okay, so that was crucial in a marriage. Without a marriage, in other words, there are ways to deal with that question, but it's not quite so simple. When I was first in the law, and remember that I became a lawyer a long time ago, in 1977, Prior to that, I was working as a, a paralegal at Vermont Legal Aid. So prior to that, and prior to the 80s, there was, if a woman had a child out of marriage, by the way, what was that called? If a, if a woman had a kid out of marriage? It was a Bad word luck. for that. What? Bad luck. Bad luck. <laughs> or not bad luck for the woman necessarily, but bad <laughs> luck. Anyway, yes, um, a mistake. But there was an even more horrible word for that kid. Remember? You're not, you don't remember the Middle Ages, you guys. The word was bastard, right? Uh, uh, that was the word for a child born out of wedlock, which meant that that child was essentially illegal. It was an illegal child. That's what illegitimate. And illegitimate was another word. Okay, there was no way to deal with that at that time because there was no way scientifically or any other way to identify the father. There were no DNA tests. That was a problem for a lot of children born illegitimate, as what, and it was a problem, of course, for the mother. That all changed once we had DNA certainty, and that was around the 70s, when now you could, now there's a blood test that can recognize who the father is if they're not married. So that has been more or less corrected. But those are the two institutions which first of all deal with uh, the question of who's the father and what kind of institutions are we gonna create around, around that, okay? All right, so marriage gave fathers rights to kids too. They, and obligations. The father has to support those kids. 
as does the mother. In a traditional marriage though, the way it was set up not so long ago, the mother was usually the stay at home mother and the father was the breadwinner. He, in other words, had um, rights to the children being the husband, rights to the custody of those children, but he also had the obligation to pay child support. Um, and that could be determined then in an unmarried situation. If a, a woman had a child out of marriage, she could then ask for a DNA test from the father. And she could also get then, if it was positive, she could also get child support from him. Those are really big, two big kinds of actions in the family court, divorce, and also parentage. There's a lot of other ones too, but those are the two that kind of deal with the separation of parties and also who gets to do what, who's obliged to do what. Okay, um, in a same-sex marriage, I don't know, what happens? Have you done, have you thought about that, Susan? There's no automatic roles, right? I mean, there's not any more either between men and women. There aren't any more in this country between men and women because often women make as much money as the male. And so then she has to pay child support. Maybe he could be the stay at home father and caretaker of the kids. However, um, in same sex marriage, that all has to be determined uh, usually on who does what rather than a kind of an automatic gender bias, I would guess, right? Have you done anything like, you've done some adoptions of that, right, Susan? Uh, uh, you're gone. Uh, I, am I unmuted? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've done a lot of same-sex adoptions and I've done a fair number of same-sex weddings. Yeah, oh, okay, all right. So we're talking about the history of marriage though. So traditionally marriages were based more or less on rigid sex roles, father breadwinner, mother support that child. And that became uh, more kind of uh, law based once the father became known in paternity actions as well. But the second question that usually the courts deal with in a divorce, not in a same sex or not in a parentage action, is alimony. Now, what is alimony about? You all know anything about alimony? Again, it's, alimony is spousal support for a wife or a husband who has spent their life contributing to the marriage and sort of making the other partner, the other partner kind of wealthy or, or wealthier. For instance, I had a, a client who is a student, but right now, but she had put her husband through medical school so that the husband has piles of money. She contributed to his doctor's license. So she will most likely be awarded alimony to support her to get herself equal to him in terms of, of monetary power. Okay, so those are the support obligations. When you enter a marriage, those are the kind of support obligations that um, are part of a marriage. Whoever is the stronger party in this country, usually still men, have to support a wife through alimony who has contributed her labor to the marriage um, and also to the support of the kids. And that's decided in the uh, magistrate's court, which is really busy, don't you think, Susan? Terribly, okay. So are there any, any thoughts or questions on that? Of course, all that's changed in this country when same-sex marriage came about. Same-sex marriage came about pretty recently when gay people, lesbians and gay men fought for the right to have their marriages recognized in the same way as a male female marriage. And that was granted uh, in the legislature in the nineties. And then it was made part of the, of 
the Supreme Court decision in the United States after that, right? So do you know when that was decided that same-sex marriages were legal through the Supreme Court? Should know that. Okay, <laughs> but same-sex marriages are a little different because children who are part of a same-sex marriage, of course, um, it's complicated with a situation with gay men. Um, I would guess that most of the gay, most gay men adopt those children. So I guess they could use surrogacy too, right? I think I think more and more the surrogacy. More more, okay, maybe you could explain what that is with surrogacy. Well, surrogacy it used to be that if you weren't able to have the child yourself, then you adopted. But now, actually, adoption nationwide is is suffering to the extent that people would prefer to have their own child, so their own biological child. So now you can take an egg from an egg donor and sperm from a sperm donor. And if you can't, and they can actually um, get the embryo and then place that and then you carry the child, or you can have the egg and the sperm in, in a surrogate parent who will carry the child. So it's possible for same-sex couples to get whatever they're missing and have either one of them, if it's women, carry the child, or if it's men, they hire a surrogate mother to carry the child. And that's becoming increasingly popular. And so many little children that could use a home are not being adopted. You're not blaming, not blaming anyone. That's just the way it's going. Um, that many more people would, if they can possibly do it through surrogacy, they will rather than adopt. So you think that there is on the on the market, so-called, a lot of kids that are not being adopted? Is that right? God. Hundreds of thousands are in foster care. In any, the last time I checked, there was over 400,000 in the United States. In foster care. Waiting, waiting. Wow. Kids that won't be adopted. That's pretty, and also many American couples go abroad to get children through adoption. Right. That, that fluctuates country by country because it'll be open for a while and then someone will do bad deeds and, you know, take babies without proper channels from moms and and then the country will shut down. So when I was a judge, it was about 22 years. For example, Guatemala would be a country where everyone would get these adorable little children from Guatemala. And then they discovered that because it was popular, people in Guatemala were stealing babies from you know, poor women and selling them. And so Guatemala shut down. And then the same thing happened with Romania and, and Vietnam. It's, it, and then they'll open up, they'll get it straightened out and open up again. But it's not as easy to adopt internationally as it once was for those reasons. Didn't you tell me once that there were a lot of adoptions of Russian children? There were a lot of adoptions for, of Russian children because people favored children that had straight hair. And straight hair? Straight hair, they want straight hair and blue eyes. And a lot of the Russian children look like that. So they were very, very popular in Romania, another place. But what happened in those countries was, and anybody who studies children, you know, young children's development, if, they're, if you're not held, it creates lifelong problems. And so children in Russia and Romania were typically kept in orphanages where they were not touched. And then they were adopted, they were these beautiful children, but they didn't get adopted until they were two or three. And by that time they had something called reactive attachment disorder, which has been studied to death. And basically it's extremely difficult to overcome. And it got to the point where you could even, when they came into court, you could tell because the children sat very stiff and they were rigid with their backs and they didn't, they didn't, you know, cling to their parents um, as, as a child who had been held from infancy. So they had a lot of uh, disrupted adoptions from those countries where after a few years, the parents said, oh, can't do this. I, I don't sent, want to. They sent them back, right? Sent them back, sent right. them back. And there was even one famous case where yeah, famous case, yeah. put a nine-year-old on a plane by herself back to Russia because she didn't want her anymore. And yeah. that shut that country down for a while. But they were, the Russians were pretty ticked off about it too, as I recall. It was rather, yeah, well, it was an international incident. Yeah, sure. right. right. Okay, so the family court then deals 
with divorce, as I mentioned. Remember too that divorce used to be an adversarial procedure. And what do I mean by that? It means that you couldn't just walk into court and say, I want a divorce and have an agreement that you would get a divorce. You had to prove grounds and reasons for it. Um, and some, and it, it, it was sort of accusatory. One person, the plaintiff would have to say, this guy did this to me, or this um, woman did this to me. When I was first here, one of the most common grounds was adultery still. And you had to, to get a divorce on adultery grounds, you had to um, prove that with witnesses in some way. That seems to have gone away. Uh, adultery with wit, I, I probably it still is a grounds for marriage, but people don't usually tend to use it very much. Another ground was intolerable severity, physical abuse, which I will talk about, um, desertion and so forth. The most common ground now is simply that you've lived separate and apart for six months with no chance of reconciliation. That is the most common ground. So it's almost no fault. However, not quite. You have to say that guy lived apart from me from six months and there is no chance of reconciliation. Pretty easy, except that I, I trapped uh, Susan's. Anyway, I had a divorce once case where I didn't want that hearing to happen that day. And so I had to quickly find a reason that that hearing, divorce hearing, would be delayed. I knew that these, this couple was very young and beautiful. And so I said to the, remember, I wanted to stall the hearing. So I said to my client, it was the woman, isn't it true that you had sex with your husband last month? Yes, great. So the court wouldn't grant the divorce because they figured, well, they reconciled. You have to testify. There's no chance of reconciliation. Anyway, so hearing got delayed for a while, for a while. Anyway, so those, that's the most common grounds. And usually what happens in a divorce is that uh, the plaintiff, remember there's two parties to a divorce. It's not like you both can get the divorce together. Plaintiff versus the defendant, two parties. One party has to say no chance of reconciliation and then the divorce is, is granted. In that process though, all the other issues have to be solved. Child custody, property, divisions, child support, alimony, stocks and bonds, pensions, and all of those property issues have to be solved, usually through an agreement. But I'm telling you that those agreements are very difficult because at the time of the divorce, and again, I think that Judge Paula will bear me out, people hate each other. Uh, and that's maybe going a little too far, but they don't like each other very much. And so reaching an agreement is often painful, don't you think? Just oh, yeah. yeah. Couple, hours, hours at it. So, and that's what that's what divorce is all about. And the, and the reason that you have to prove some kind of a ground, like adultery, like intolerable severity, is because that is the breach of the original, or like adultery in particular, remember the contract. You promised to be monogamous. You promised to be faithful. And if you can prove adultery, then you have, you can prove it that that person has broken the marital contact, contract and then you are eligible for a divorce. Okay, so go ahead. Who's asked Beth? Beth, I don't know, I don't understand where, when you take wedding vows, they're not like like when you officiate at a wedding that you can say any you know people can say anything they want to each other. So where does all of the legal uh, the legal elements of a marriage come in? How do you know? You can't say anything. Like I saw a Smothers Brothers movie once and there was a marriage in it and they said, oh, we'll stay together until it doesn't feel good. Uh -huh. That would not be a marriage contract, right? Right. You do have to make an offer. Will you marry me? Yes, that's offer and acceptance. And when you do, you have to make certain promises. Now, I don't know, you can word it differently. In other words, you have to promise to love, honor and obey 
and not obey anymore, but love and honor till death do you part. And to be faithful to one person. What? I, mean, I officiated at a wedding, wedding last summer and they just, you know, they didn't say any of those things. What did they say then? They're not married. Well, they loved each other and, you know, yeah. but, but. Well, till death do you part? No, I don't, well, I don't know. All of the legal things that come with, that come with a marriage, is there like a, when you, it's like a contract that you're signing. Yes. You don't yes. really know what it says, do you? No. But it binds you, doesn't it? And you find, when do you find out, out that you entered into a contract is when you get divorced, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of amazing to think about the fact that there's so many legal things that are implied in a wedding in getting married, but we don't know what they are. You don't get- well, you should it. know what they are. I mean, you know that you're supposed to be monogamous, right? Or not? Well, I mean- Nobody is, a few people are. Right. But that's the, isn't it? Well, I mean, all the, I mean, all the things about alimony and yeah, right. child support and all those things. You, did, you didn't know all that when you got married? No. <laughs> okay. That I guess it, to many people, it's a surprise, right? Right. I mean, it's kind of like civics. I think people don't know those things when they get married. They don't oh, by the way, much. what's the, okay. So Susan, this is a contract question. What's the consideration for the for the marital contract? Can't hear you. But you're uh, you're muted. I'm mute. I I think it's the those promises basically to yeah, oh, I think in same sex marriage monogamous and all that. Yeah. By the way, Beth, consideration is a kind of complicated notion every contact every contract has a, something to bind it together in other words usually it's money correct like when you go to the store and you say i want to or let's say a rental agency for a car you say i want that car the, the the agency says okay you can have it but what do you what do you have to then do to cement the contract you have to pay a pile of money right okay right. In a marriage, you have to do something to make that contract real. In other words, you have to give up something in order to get that contract in place. What is it? And without that, you do not have a marriage. You know what it is? Susan, do you know what it is? It's sex. Yeah. It's sex. If some, mm -hmm. if, if these two people get married and they are expecting sex and either the man or woman says, nah, I don't feel like it. That's not, then the marriage is not consummated. Right, then you can get an annulment. Then you can get an annulment, correct. I just did an annulment, Susan. Okay, Beth, do you get, do you understand that? Yeah, I do. I'm just, you know, it's like when you sign a contract with a contractor or to buy something, you have a piece of paper that tells you all of the things that you're obligated to. And that doesn't happen in a, in a marriage. It does though in other countries actually, okay. But I'll tell you what you do have to get in order to get married. What, what do you have to have in order to get married? A license. A license, Great. correct? You have to go to the state and get a license. Why is that, do you suppose, Susan? And that makes it legal. So they can track where you got married so that if you say later that I'm, mar I'm, I'm, I'm married, they can prove that you are by your license being recorded in the town clerk's office. Yeah, the license gets recorded. I, I'm not... I think it's because the state ultimately, as I mentioned before, the state takes jurisdiction over marriage, I think, in order to protect the vulnerable that are in the marriage. Usually women, especially in other countries, and children. So that, that subjects you to the jurisdiction of the state. That's what I would guess, right? Okay, so I have, I'm, I have an office right now at the Association of Americans uh, living in Vermont. I see very, a lot of marriages that are not legal. And why is that? Because they didn't get married by an agent of the state. And that they got married in maybe um, a foreign country by a holy man, an imam or something like that, that is not legal in this country. You have to have kind of the blessings of the state in some way. 
even if you get married in a church with a priest or a minister, that they are also agents of the state at that time, right? Or justice of the peace. Beth, when you're a justice of the peace, is that right? No, I, I filled out that form to be an officiant for one day. Yeah, but you had to fill out a form, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you had to submit it where? To the Secretary of State. And you are not a Justice of the Peace? No. No. Wow. Anybody can do it if for a day. You're, you're a minister for the day then? Or yeah. Something like that? Okay. All right. Um, anyway, so there's those. So there's a lot of problems in the, the people that are coming here. A lot of family problems. Unsolvable in our courts also in many ways. Okay, so all of those problem, all of those factors have to go in with the settlement of the divorce. Property, children, custody, support, and alimony. All of that has to be solved before you get a divorce. Yeah, Susan? And your legal rights and responsibilities too. You got to- oh, Sorry. Throw yeah. Why don't you say about that? Because that's now called legal rights and responsibilities. Well, it's just that they- sort of bifurcated it between just who, who has physical custody of the children and who makes the legal decision, such as where do they go to school and what church do they go to if they go to a church at all. And your life can really become a living hell if you have physical custody, but not legal custody. Because your ex-spouse controls what you can do with the children from afar. So the battle over who has legal custody is equally as significant as who has physical custody. Oh, and then visitation too, and that can mm -hmm. be well. The, the presumption in the court right now, as I see it, about custody is that both parents should share time with the kids, both. I'm not certain that's such a great idea, but that's what the court would like, right? Okay, Jane, did you, were you gonna say something? Jane? No, 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 the only question, the only question I had was about, about um, medical, Tests required if you for the um, require required for marriage so so that like so that you don't have a, have an RH factor baby for for example or um, no they don't require that anymore they used to require blood tests for syphilis actually but I don't recall that anymore right. Um, I guess when you would be pregnant, maybe you would, you would have that test, but it's, I think it's voluntary. Okay, any other thoughts about, okay, so how is custody then decided? How is custody decided? All right, anybody have any ideas about that? The way that custody is decided, it seems to me, is whomever has had primary care and been the primary parent in a case, right? And that still is usually a mother that usually has the primary care of children. Um, fathers still in general are still the, the, the person who goes out and works and the mother usually is the, is the person who has primary care. And if the child is doing well and it's a contested custody fight, the mother in general will get custody. However, the court presumes that joint custody is the best. Do you also think that's true, Susan, that the court presumes that more and more? Yeah, I, I, I thought that was the presumption that they thought yeah. joint custody was the best. I, I don't agree with it, but I think that is what- yeah, the, I, I don't agree with it either. Yeah. But it happens. And they try to get as close to 50-50 as possible. Um, and that involves, I think that the biggest problem I see with that is that means that you're in a lot of ways, if you have joint custody, you're going to stay married until those children are 18, because you can't move. You, you have to stay close to each other if you're going to really stay, uh, have custody 50-50% time. Um, and it is really, really hard to reverse that presumption of 50-50, even if, and it takes hours to have a custody fight anyway. Okay, is there any questions about that? All right, so that's really what, who was talking? Oh, it was me, Jane. I was just like, what does joint custody, joint custody mean? Do you specify 
do you specify what each couple will do for the child? I mean, like who, um, uh, I mean, uh, and I mean, how do you do, I mean, how, what, what, what do, um, yeah, what, um, do you specify, uh, is it specified how much time each, each, I mean, yeah. do you have, yeah. have the same, the same number, I mean, the, 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 you, that they, the child spends exactly as much time with them? That's, what, that, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying, that, that that's what happens uh, a lot is that um, it's really pretty much 50 50 and and by the way the person who's supposed to pay child support also if he or she has that child 50 percent of the time they get a child support credit also right so the non-custodial parent often asks for 50 50 so they don't have to pay as much child support and you're right jane it means 50 50 in general um, and that causes a lot of problems, a lot of problems with, with working out a schedule, like person lives in St. Albans versus Burlington, where are you gonna drop off the kid? What school are they gonna go to? Because joint custody also requires agreements. And if you don't like each other so much, you're getting a divorce. How are you gonna work out those kinds of agreements until the child is 18? And I don't think people in general like each other that much when they get divorced, right? For those of you who have all been married, it's tough. Well, except except when both parents turn out to be gay, like 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 a friend of my brother's and <laughs> um, and his and, and, his, and his wife both turned out to be turned turned a very amicable divorce, and they and they live right near each other, and the kids have got the best of both worlds. No, I know, but that means they're going to have to live with each other near yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 that's. I mean, that's, you know, um, I mean, men and women can get along, male and female parents too can get along fine, and many do. But at the moment of divorce, in general, mm -hmm. they don't feel great about each other, and and this isn't the, the thing I always caution anybody I deal with is look at you better agree to this because it's going to be very difficult to change any of it until this kid is eighteen. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Susan's laughing. Yeah. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Just the, the way you're describing it makes me laugh. Why? Just it's just true. It's very true. Mm -hmm. And you knock your head out. You know that you if, if you're a lawyer and they charge a lot of money. As many of you maybe know, I don't charge a lot of money, but most most lawyers charge a whole lot of money, and it's hours and hours of working out these agreements. And then afterwards, if you go back to your lawyer because you don't like the agreement, then it's more hours, more court time. Yeah. I think so. Wow. All right. Okay. So uh, anyway, yeah. the, anyway, does anybody have any questions then about divorce or parentage is pretty much the same thing, except a parentage action, again, determines who's the father and then what kind of obligations that father is going to have. But that father doesn't have any obligations around alimony and no right to your property either. A simple question in a parentage action, who's the father, who's going to have custody, and parental contact and then child support. And those take forever too. Because many men, of course, say I'm not the father in the first place. So then you have to have a blood test about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Including one that I'm involved in now that was, oh my God, this father was, anyway, he was hotly denying it. And it went on and on for hours about, you know, what what was your sex? When did you have sex? Oh yeah, yeah, it was painful. And of course, the present court is all on the phone, right? So, okay. The, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that prior to when I first became a lawyer, there was no such thing as a civil way to get a restraining order. For instance, if uh, you are the victim of abuse, and again, I, I have to be specific gender, usually the victim of abuse is a female and the, and the abuser is the male. If that was happening in your home, it happened in my home actually all the time, um, you could not get a restraining order. There was no such thing as getting in the family court some kind of an order that your bu abuser had to stay away. You had to call the police. And believe me, the police never wants to come to that situation. 
as a as a kind of a tangent, one of the reasons that I feel rather differently than most people do about defunding the police is that there are so many cases of domestic violence in our community right now that I don't want a woman to be stuck calling a social worker in that situation because the only uh, the only, you know, the only person that could possibly deal with that situation as an ongoing situation is the police officer who would come into your house and take the abuser out of your house. Social worker can't do that. So when I was a first an attorney, uh, paralegal, there was no kind of civil court which dealt with it. The only way to deal with it was calling the police. Now you can actually call a judge in the middle of the night, and I hope it's not Susan, but you can call a judge in the middle of the night and say, look at this guy, this man usually is hurting me and I want an immediate restraining order and the court can issue that ex parte. In other words, by the testimony of the victim alone and they can get restraining orders that way. But when I was first in the law, that was not possible and you had to call the police and, the, and that's the most dangerous time for a police officer, by the way. It's very dangerous for a police officer to go into a home where there's abuse because the tempers are hot, they might have a gun, they might have weapons. And so the police were often very reluctant to uh, intervene in that case. And the third thing before I turn this over to Susan, unless um, Susan, you, you, there, you can think of other things, is the juvenile court. Now, what is the juvenile court? Does everybody know what that is? No, Beth? Jane? No, I mean, no. you've never been it, I hope. Juvenile no. court has jurisdiction, as I recall, in three areas. One, if a child commits a criminal act, it's called a delinquency. Second, if the parents have neglected the children and the state intervenes and has to take the children out of the house for some reason. The third, if the child is being abused by the parents, and again, the state has the right to intervene and get that child out of the house. And there used to be a category called unmanageable, and those were kids who were runaways. In, that, in those instances, if there's a report or a neighbor, relative, the report goes to DCF, the Department of Children and Families, and they can get into your house and take your kid away. Very controversial. Usually, I, I, I admire those social workers, but no kid uh, that I've ever seen wants to leave their home. And so usually it really can be a disaster, right? And those in juvenile court is confidential. None of the other courts in the family court are confidential. Juvenile court is. So it really is that the state is in your life as um, when you're in juvenile court as parents. I'm saying this because in our, in our situation right now in the United States, there's such an epidemic of drug abuse that parents often lose their kids to DCF. Um, and it is a shame. It's really difficult to get kids back. And, and it's, it's tragic to me when that happens because above all, kids want to be with their parents for whatever reason, they want to be with their parents and they grow up feeling, I don't know, it's, it's a terrible tragedy to the part of the parent too who feels like an absolute failure if they lose their kids. Anyway, so those are the elements of the family court really of the of uh, people who are in general alive and kicking. And Susan, as a probate judge, dealt with all kinds of issues of death and other issues too. But maybe in the probate court, maybe you could comment on some of that, Susan, okay? So when put, most people don't ever think of the probate court until somebody dies and they have to go to the probate court, but they actually, it does cover quite a few things. The main thing that people go to probate court for is when somebody dies. So if you have, if you die and you have a will or even if, if you die, if, if, if you die, you may not die, Sandy, but the rest of us probably will. Yeah. Um, it, you have to go, if you own any property at the time of your death and you don't have it protected from through a trust, you have to go to the probate court to open an estate so that the property gets directed 
in the manner in which you wanted, the where, where you wanted to go, as you set forth in your will. And if you don't have a will, then the state decides where your property goes. And the court's job is to make sure that it goes where the state says it should go. Um, so that's, that's the main thing people think of when they think of the probate court. But in addition to that, they do a lot of other things that are very much personal to people's families. Um, and I was surprised when I started there how much a percentage of the court's time is taken up in family court type of activities. So in addition to the estates, there's trust. Trust we won't really deal with here because it's really just a way people protect assets and it's not really relevant to the family court stuff too much. But the other thing that the court does a lot of is guardianships. And there's, we had a generally in Chittenden County about 850 open at any given time. That's quite a few guardianships. And they- Why don't you explain what, what, why people have, what is a guardianship? Why, so there's different kinds of guardianships. There's adult guardianships, and then there's minor guardianships. And within the minor guardianships, there's emergency guardianships and non-emergency guardianships. And within the adult guardianships, there's voluntary and involuntary guardianships. So I'm just going to run through them very quickly. An adult guardianship would be if somebody like your mother gets becomes diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and can no longer pay her own bills and she starts spending money on turtles and buys thousands of them and the house is full, you know, that kind of thing. You're spending all their money on crazy stuff. Then the kids get worried because they see their inheritance going down the drain and they rush to court to file a guardianship for the mother so that they can control her assets and she no longer has control of them. So if mother consented to that and said, yes, I'm wrong about the turtles and I want someone to control me, she would then get a voluntary guardianship, which is a very streamlined procedure. So she comes to court and she says, yes, I'm out of control with the turtles. I want my daughter to control my money. And, and then I would appoint the daughter as a voluntary guardian. The beauty of a voluntary guardian is that the person who asked for it, which is the mother, can terminate it just as easily as it started. So that's a nice kind of guardianship because if you think you're gonna have a problem and it turns out you don't, then you can just come to the court and say, I don't want it anymore and it ends. An involuntary guardianship is when the daughter, for example, says, mother, you have a turtle problem. Mother says, no, I don't. And the daughter goes to court and files a petition to appoint a guardian on mother's behalf over her objection. And in that case, we appoint an attorney for the mother and we get an evaluation by an independent psychiatrist or psychologist. And then we have a hearing to determine whether um, she meets the legal criteria for a guardian. If the, a guardian is appointed, the person under guardianship cannot simply terminate it. it ha they have to prove that they no longer need a guardianship. So it can be a very much, an, a, I mean, it, it can be a very good thing, but it, it's also very rife with abuse. Uh, there are many, many hearings where people are misbehaving with the guardianships and using money in inappropriate ways, and then you have to remove the guardian. Um, so that's, that's adult guardianships. Minor guardianships happen when a parent can't take care of a child, for example, for whatever reasons. Oftentimes it's drug abuse, but they don't want the state to come in and swipe their child away. So they have the wherewithal to say, look, I'm a drug addict and I can't take care of my child, but I don't want him to go into DCF custody. So I'm going to appoint my brother as the guardian. And then they would appoint, they would file a petition to appoint a guardian for their child. And they would come in and, and those, we've set up lots and lots of those hundreds every year voluntarily. Sometimes parents move to Florida. It's just to be typical. Parents move to Florida. It's warm. It's sunny. The schools are terrible. They get down there and the kids are all in gangs. And, the, and I had several every single year of parents sending their kids back from Florida to live with an aunt or uncle because they wanted them in the Vermont school district. Um, parents stayed there on the sunny beach, but let, sent the kid home. So those, those are very, very typical as well. Um, and they couldn't be very, one problem with them, very much like family court in a custody matter is they often are set up voluntarily. So if I'm a drug addict, just 
for an example, and I can't take care of my child, I might name my friend or my brother or my mother to be the guardian. And then six months later, I've done my rehab, I want my child back, and I come to court and say, I want the guardianship to end. And the person who's the guardian says, well, no, I don't think so, because you're still a drug addict, you're still fill in the blank. And they're very, very emotional. Um, they can be extremely difficult yeah. Yeah. because it's pitting family, it's usually a family member who is the guardian and it's pitting siblings against one another, parents against children. They're very difficult hearings. And, uh, but, right. but if it works, if you have someone good, it does keep the child out of the state system and the state out of your family. And unless, someone abuses the child while in guardianship, the state would not become involved at all. So it's really just a family matter. And many, many, many of them work very smoothly. So there's that. Then there's adoptions. The probate court does all the adoptions. And they are not only just in Chittenden County, for example, but if any place where an adoption agency has an office, they can file for adoption. So adoptions for the London for example, the Lund Family Center, which does a phenomenally good job. Um, they have offices all over the state, uh, but because they have an office in Chittenden, and if they didn't happen to like, I was doing a lot of same-sex adoptions before they were popular, so to speak. And so they were bringing all of them to me from all around the state. So you can file an adoption in Chittenden County if you go through an agency that has an office here. Otherwise, you have to file where you live, whatever county you live in. And in some counties, they didn't agree with the same sex statute when it came through and they just weren't doing it. And so they were just kind of piling into Chittenden, which was fine with me. Um, in conjunction with those adoptions, we the court would do termination of parental rights. Right, now that's, that's complicated, right? Because It's complicated. Yeah, because to get a kid adopted, you do have to terminate the biological. Right, you cannot, one parent cannot relinquish a child for adoption. So if um, if a mother were to say, I'm relinquishing my child for adoption, she has to either get the father to consent or the court has to terminate his parental rights. So those, again, can be very acrimonious hearings because you notice them, some fathers really don't care and they just don't show up and then their rights are terminated. But many, many do care and want to parent their children and they don't want the child given up for adoption. And so you end up with a hearing because it's usually the mom saying, I'd rather give the child for adoption than have you jerk raise the child. And so you have the hearing against the father jerk, against the mother who doesn't want. And uh, so those were always very emotional hearings um, mm -hmm. as well. And so, and then we, did a lot of incidental things that you, would, you wouldn't think about, you have to come to the court for, but you do. If you wanna change your name, for example, you come to the probate court. If your birth certificate is incorrect or you change your gender, you come to the probate court. So oh, can you do that? Can you change your birth record based on sex? You can, you can, you can, but that all happened in the last few years. And again, those are all, you know, the law changes and then people and courts are slow to adapt to it. So some courts would just make it difficult for people to do that kind of stuff. And so they would tend to want to gravitate towards where the court made it easier to do what legally they're entitled to do. But some courts just were so difficult that people would either give up or move to a place where they could do it more easily. Um, but those things all come to the court. And we also authorize people you can do, it was that Beth was talking about being made uh, efficient for a day to do, an, a, to do a marriage. That's a fairly new thing, but you always could do an, a, a marriage if you were an out of state minister. And then you would have to file a petition with the probate court to appoint you in Vermont to perform the marriage. So you'd have to send in your, your, your certification that you were some sort of, uh, priest or officiant and that, those were kind of funny sometimes because they were clearly like right off the internet you know they're like a cracker jacks box <laughs> priest for a day and they would send it in and then then we would appoint them for the day to marry the poor smalls uh, but it was a marriage i hope wasn't it yeah yeah sure yeah we did it and uh, and then a lot of other things that are too boring to talk about those are the big things okay any questions? No? Okay, so um, 
I did I did have another some other thoughts about this because this community is now I'm glad of it too a refugee community and immigrant community. Uh, as some of you know, I have my office at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, and th those people there, both Jacob and Tato, do enormous work for the refugee and the immigrant community. And sometimes I'm privileged enough to work with them, with those immigrants and refugees on their family problems. And you get to know uh, how, what kinds of cultures those people come from and also how they do or they don't adapt and what kinds of problems that they're going to have in this country. And I've seen uh, vast differences in culture which leads them into the family court. For instance, there's again, as I mentioned before, many kind of informal marriages that, are, that take place um, among many of the people I see. In other words, I don't mean informal exactly, I mean the marriages that are not recognized here in this country. For instance, getting married in a Kenyan refugee camp by a Muslim imam, but no marriage certificate, no marriage license. How do I deal then with a divorce in that situation? How do I deal with who should have custody of the children in that situation? The other practice I've seen to some extent is also multiple wives in general, that there is still the idea in many societies of polygamy, that a man, a man, not women, I mean, I don't know any woman who would want a lot of husbands, maybe I'm wrong about that, but it doesn't seem like they usually do, uh, but that men often in other cultures do often have more than one wife. And sometimes the men here do think that that's the law here and that they're allowed to have more than one wife at the same time. And that of course is a crime, that's called bigamy. And so, but it's very tricky. So that's a problem I see, how to deal with that. The other problem I see is that immigrants and refugees are often moving around a great deal. So a mother gets custody of five kids, comes to me and tries to get child support from a husband. And I say, where's your husband? Well, I don't know. He moved back to Africa. He moved back to Nepal. I don't know where he is. That is a continuing problem in this community because what's happening is that we have mothers in, in this community, perhaps don't even speak English. They might have five, seven kids and no way to get any kind of support. And because they don't know English, they also don't have many skills that are marketable I think it's a, it's a real community problem that we have to pay attention to, that, that many of these mothers find themselves really in poverty and um, very little is, is being done to help them. Um, and also I see in a lot of communities and also our own community, lots of physical abuse, right? So, and that's very difficult to deal with. Anyway, so I don't know, what else, Susan? You're smiling. Muted. You're muted. I'm smiling because I'm smiling because I did Patricia Crocker's adoption, and she just put that up there, so that always makes me. Did smile. you? What? Yeah, that's nice. That's always a happy thing. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I digress. Okay, but you're saying also the Lund Home is very active in in uh, oh. adoptions, right? Right. Well, Lund Home is phenomenal. They're they're very very good in in everything. Well, that's where our daughter was born. Rosie was yeah, born. They, they just are very caring, conscientious, competent, capable people. And yeah. what is the, uh, what's happening? They took over, for an example, in the family court. Family court also terminates parental rights, as you know. They do? No, I didn't really know that much. They do, their termination parental rights in the family But the, do they do it in the juvenile court? Yes. Yeah, right. Yes, they do. And, but what was happening in the 90s was, well, at, before the 90s, but I came in in 95. And there were literally hundreds of kids whose the rights had been terminated, but then they never got it together to file a petition for adoption. The, the, the court the, the court had to do it. And, and, and they never got the paperwork together to file in the probate court. So the kids were never adopted. Their oh, wow. rights were 
adaptive, but they weren't adopted. And I started doing these adoptions and the parents would literally be sobbing. And that I would think we were having this wonderful, happy day and they would be sobbing because they said, we've waited five years for this to happen. We never thought it would happen. So I contacted the Supreme Court and I forgot the wonderful Jim Morse when he was up uh, there. Jim Morse, yeah. situation and he got in touch with the Lund home. Lund home got a contract with the family court and we did 281 adoptions in one year. Wow. The Lund home. Wow. We, they cleaned up the docket over the course of about three years and now there's no lapse at all. It, it just goes right to Lund and Lund does it. They're Except that I mean, you said that surrogacy was replacing adoption. It's well, in many, yes, it, it, it is in many cases because people who can't have children biologically for one reason or another now have other options. Whatever piece is missing, they can get someplace else. It didn't used to be that way. It wasn't, you know, people don't always adopt just because they're saints and they want to help a child. They adapt for reasons like I adopted because I wanted to have kids and I couldn't. So I adopted. Um, but many people who can't have kids biologically would prefer not to adopt. So if there's a way that they can still have their own egg or their own sperm or both and have somebody else carry the child, great, let's do that. Very, I would guess it's very expensive, right? Very Those, expensive, and very and expensive. And what, but, if, you know, what, what, local if surrogate mother, what if the surrogate mother, there's a whole line of cases, I believe in the 80s maybe, about what happens if the surrogate mother says, I'm not going to give up this child. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And now it's very, very ironclad. But, you know, local lawyer that I gave my adoption practice to gave it up and became a surrogate attorney because there's so much more money in it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. But I'm not, I mean, what kind of rights then does the surrogate mother have? Very that? few. It's not a great deal. And she has to sign an ironclad contract saying that no matter what, it's not her child. And um, and you can even get a, a birth certificate now before the child is born. Wow. Name the birth, biological it, 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 birth certificate. You can get a birth certificate. Well, it's not issued to the child's born, but you can get the order beforehand because genetically, the person carrying the child is not the biological parent under the law because it's not her egg. And, and so the egg and the sperm are from someone else. So those someone else's are shown on the birth certificate instead of the, it used to be the oh, 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 yeah, I get known it. as the mom. And then they had to go through this process of changing it. And the, and the biological parents didn't like that. They wanted their name on it from the outset. So there was a lot of litigation around it and they ended up being able to do that. Wow. So the surrogate mom really, really, wow. does, it's not a great deal for her unless you like being pregnant. Well, maybe, I know, but I remember, I remember really a series of cases called, remember the baby M case where, where the biological mother, not the egg mother, but the, the surrogate refused to give right. up. And, so, and the court decided in that case, it was a New Jersey case, that you that the contract itself was against public policy and could not yep. be enforced. And the mother got to keep the kid. Anyway. The, the, surrogate, the surrogate mother. Yeah. 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 And, the, and then since then, they've gone through all kinds of um, machinations to make sure those contracts are iron. Uh, it's hard for the surrogate mom to, I think it'd be very, very difficult for the surrogate mom to get the child now. Right. Also, the, the one thing I, I guess I wanted to, unless uh, any questions again from Patricia Crocker, anyway, anybody? The one thing I wanted to mention, and it's kind of painful to even talk about, is the situation in the courts right now, especially in the, well, I don't know in the family court, but I don't do much in other courts is that during the pandemic, the court system shut down pretty much. Um, and during that period of time, you couldn't have a jury trial is my understanding, right, Susan? Or any kind of hearings in person, none, none in person. And at the same time that that happened, the court also went to an entirely electronic system so that anytime a lawyer has to file, anytime you request a hearing, you have to use a very difficult uh, cumbersome electronic system. So the court is really gone pretty much digital, hasn't it? 
And yeah. it is very, very difficult, particularly for poor people to manage. That to me, I mean, during the time that I was at Legal Aid and later, there was a whole promise that the courts would be equally accessible or you know, justice for all. And that's become very, very difficult. And I wanted to sort of kind of end on that note. I have no idea what we're gonna do about it, but it seems to me that lawyers are fighting with that system every day. But mm -hmm. anyway, what do you think, Susan? No, I agree. I mean, I, it, I think it's a denial of access to justice because if you can't access the, I have a mentor through Mercy Connections, mentee through Mercy Connections who can't file a guardianship form because she can't use the electronic system. And they're gonna, they told her- not even in the state, right? Not even in the state. And they told her they were gonna terminate her guardianship that she worked so hard to get if she can't electronically file this stuff. Well, she doesn't have a computer. She can't use it. She can barely read. I mean, it seems egregiously wrong that you could do that to someone. And I'm not sure why it isn't being challenged. I don't either. I don't get it. And it's also mm -hmm. expensive. It, it, mm -hmm. In a way, it follows with everything else that's happening with our society is that everything is becoming digital. And it, it seems to me a very difficult, almost inhuman world. And I don't understand why that has happened either, but it has. All right. Well, anyway, any final thoughts from anybody? Okay. Well, I'm sure the family court will always be open to discussion because it affects everybody's life. So anyway, I can tell you Susan's phone number if you or mine. <laughs> if you do have any questions though, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Um, I don't charge for that. Um, and please give me a call. Do not stumble into court uneducated about what you're getting into, okay? And so my cell phone is 802-355-4968 and call me anytime and I mean it. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. You do a great job. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. You. you can give them my number too, if you want. No, you give it. I don't feel comfortable giving up. Okay. My, my number is 802-238-3778. But I don't, I don't practice in the courts anymore. I work for companies, so I can't go to court. So I'm going to call Sandy and tell her to help you. Well, okay. That's fine. <laughs> great. Thank all right. You. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah. See ya. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.